Um, my name is Amara. I'm really, really excited to be here today. Um, I'm actually coming off of a trip from Seattle where I was presenting at Society of Women Engineers. So I'm like super hyped right now. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to come across in the presentation, so I'm going to try to kind of scale it back a little, not talk super fast at you. Um, but this is a really, really exciting topic for me. Um, I get to share a year plus work of journey or a year plus work in a journey um, that I hope everyone can kind of gain some insights from maybe find things that are applicable to your situation um, but yeah um, it's currently in progress today so at the end I'm not going to be like and here's all the exciting things I learned because I'm still learning so I'll share some things that I'm working on and some things that um, I have learned along the way all right, so we're good? Yeah, we're good. Uh, this is a picture of me presenting at the Unite LA conference. Um, if you're not familiar, Unity is a 3D gaming engine. Um, it's not just for games, although there are a lot of mobile games built on top of Unity. Um, and as you heard in my bio, or as you read in my bio, I'm not a game developer at all. I am an enterprise engineer by training, I guess you should say. But last year I took a focus on AR, VR, and game developers through our Watson SDK for Unity. Um, so this was a really interesting space for me. I'm not a game developer. I've worked with SDKs before. I've definitely had a lot of experience with our Watson services in particular. I'm a developer advocate that focuses on AI, so it includes our Watson services. Um, but Game development was a totally new space for me. So I wanted to identify barriers to entry for our Watson products and our other AI products for game developers specifically, um, or developers that are building on game engines. There's a little subtle difference there, but I'm probably gonna refer to them as game developers rather than end developers that build on gaming engines. Um, I wanted to build off of the online content that we already had. I wanted to be able to supplement what we already had. Um, but the fact of the matter is, um, my team, IBM developer, and the rest of our advocate teams, we really focus on enterprise developers. And enterprise developers and game developers are kind of two distinct beasts. Um, there is some overlap in some cases, but a lot of times their perspectives, their paradigms, their experiences are two totally separate things. And you'll hear some of that more as we continue. Um, but specifically, I wanted these developers to get up and running on our IBM cloud, building solutions with AI really quickly. And again, as you're potentially kind of hearing um, as I'm talking, AI is really challenging. You're potentially bringing in folks who don't really know what AI is, they've never built anything with AI, and I'm trying to get them up and running very quickly. So I'm hoping that you're seeing some potential for roles popping up, right? So before I got to this point, speaking at Unite LA, I set out to build a really simple project with the SDK to understand a little bit about what the process might look like, um, at least from my perspective, my paradigms, obviously coming from a very different background than most of the game developers that I have talked to at this point, at least. Very few people are moving from the enterprise space <laughs> into game development. Um, it's, it's probably hard. But at least having this experience, I would understand a little bit more about what the community was um, working through or potentially suffering with. So I mentioned I'm part of our IBM developer team. This is the, the web page that you hit if you go to developer.ibm.com. It's a huge website that contains things called code patterns, which are end-to-end -end solutions that show a bunch of different technologies both IBM Cloud and open source working together um, so that you, as the developer, can see it running. Um, we also have tutorials, articles, other information to just really help our developer community. And our developer community already is huge. So anything IBM Cloud related, we cover, which is enormous if you look at our catalog. So this site has to be able to cater to pretty much every developer that we're expecting to use our cloud, which just because we say it's enterprise developers is really not true, it's everyone. And I'm one of many awesome individuals who work on this, 
let alone our products and docs. So I'm sharing my story. Um, it's not totally comprehensive of all of the folks that are working on this. And I'm the only one that's really focused on game dev, so you can't really get any of this information from anyone else. <clears throat> so I'm going to make this a little bit interactive, and this is where the room cringes and goes, oh no, don't make me work. Um, so I'm hoping that the coffee's kicked in by now. But let's do a quick thought exercise. You might not be in the exact same boat that I'm in, but I'm hoping that we can kind of set some expectations here and, and go through this. So let's think of some things that might apply to the creation of personas. And I hesitate to really call them personas, but let's do that for now. So if I say, what is an enterprise developer? What are some things that come to your mind? <coughs> and these can be kind of generalizations. I'm going to show you a bunch of generalizations. I can make those because I was an enterprise developer. Um, but just start thinking in your head, what are, what are some of the things when you hear enterprise developer, what comes to your mind? Or if those are folks in your developer community, what are some of the things that they say? Revenue driven. Revenue driven, great. RFCs. RFCs, great. Big. Big, Big. awesome. Big. Security. Ooh, security, awesome. This is, this is great. So here are some of my sweeping generalizations um, that are pretty much exactly what I was dealing with. And it might be a little bit of an eye chart depending on where you're sitting. Um, some of my assumptions, if you will, or generalizations, or what I was actually dealing with. <coughs> it's gonna be a mid to large company. You're probably gonna sit in an IT or software services group. You're probably co-located, because that's a big deal right now with Agile. I put Agile in quotes here because, at least in my organization, we were wagile at best. Um, being comfortable with things like acronyms, having really specific tech stacks, integrations with Salesforce and SAP. Before joining my first role, I didn't know what ABAP was. I thought that was like a character from a book. Very familiar with that now. Maybe they're doing something with open source. Um, I hesitate to say what. Maybe they're just consuming it. They may not be contributing, who knows. Um, they're probably going to have some sort of access to training, and they're going to have a budget over zero dollars. And I'm sure my previous management would be like, well, actually, you did have a budget of zero dollars, but uh, Jim, I knew it was bigger than zero. So, um, cool. So these are kind of some of the things that I was thinking about, um, and this is how my brain works. I like to jot things down. I like to make lists. Um, but the real truth of this is, and some folks in the room hinted at this earlier, an enterprise developer is going to be well supported, budgeted, and incentivized to make things work. No one goes home at the end of the day and is an enterprise developer in their spare time. Can we all agree on that? Yeah? So this is their day job. And we can make some assumptions about this given their current tech stack, their skill set, their products, what's going on in their organization, um, which makes this group of people fairly easy to work with. We know what we're getting into and we have these conversations with people when they list off certain um, pieces of technology that they're working with, whether it's a platform, a library, a framework, we can already kind of get an understanding of potentially where they're going, what they're looking at doing uh, with their solutions today. Now arguably the harder one, if I say what is a game developer, what are some of the things that you think of? That's high school. Ha High school student, yes. More of like a hobbyist. More of like a hobbyist. Anyone else? Yes. Small and independent. Small and independent. Ooh, we're, we know exactly where this is going. Yes. Yes. Workaholic. Workaholic, yes. Cool, awesome. Development. Awesome, we have done great with this thought exercise. So these are some of the things that not only I thought of, but when I was going out to the community, whether it was online, offline, these are some of the things that I was experiencing. Now, this is kind of pulled out of an email that I ended up having to send to my management because they were like, Amar, what the hell is a game developer? And I was like, oh, let me tell you. And then as I started bulleting things out, I realized it's a really fluid definition. So you have folks that are in the indie space, which may literally be one developer working on an entire title. I don't know if anybody here is a gamer, but Stardew Valley, for instance, is a really great example of a project that was a single person um, before it ended up being poured into like every platform now, which is fantastic. 
Um, but you have this group of folks that range from one person in an indie atmosphere all the way up through triple A, which is the big titles that are out on Xbox, uh, PlayStation, on consoles. They're the ones that you're like, Blizzard, Ubisoft, Activision, like those big name developers and publishers are pushing out. So there's gonna be some differences here, and I'm not gonna read through all of these, but you should see multiple bullet points. It says variety, variety, variety. And I could say spectrum, I could say some other things as well. Um, but the real big thing is, you don't know what you're getting into when you're talking to game developers. You don't know their, their background, you don't know their skill set, you don't know what they're comfortable with. One of the big flags in here is, I have folks who write really, really awesome games and tell me they're not technical. They're like, oh, I'm just a designer, or I'm just a game developer. You're technical. You are absolutely technical if you're sitting down and writing a game. There's no, there's no way you can be. But, the big thing here is, and someone kind of hinted at it, which is fantastic, I love this. Um, this may be their day job, second job, hobby, passion product, it, pro passion project. Um, it might be part of a game jam, they don't really call them hackathons in the game industry. Um, it might be part of a game jam that they've you know, decided to enter, they really didn't know where to take it from there, things like that. But we have to keep this in mind when we're developing content for these folks or we're going to absolutely lose them. Really the only assumptions that we can make about what's going on in the games industry right now, particularly with game developers, is maybe we can make some assumptions about the kind of games that they want to build and maybe those are the battle royale games that we're seeing a lot of, so the PUBGs, the Fortnites, we have kids, I'm sure they're playing Fortnite. Um, those are what we're seeing because they're big revenue generators right now. But it doesn't really tell us a lot about their tech stack. Maybe it tells us a little bit about multiplayer, but that's still not really enough to do anything with. So that the interactive portion is over. You can kind of breathe a sigh of relief. I'm not gonna ask any more questions. So really interesting, when I started off on this, this journey was a discussion that I had with the folks at Unity. And I said, you know, what, is, what does your developer community look like? Because they have a really great forum, they have a really great docs team. Um, I've bragged about them on Twitter a number of times because they, they really get it. They really understand who their audience is. And the thing that struck me was this idea of nights and weekends developers, which goes along the lines with this hobbyist idea. So, okay, cool. I'm going to try to make sure that our docs, our tutorials, make sense for that night and weekend developer so we don't alienate these folks, so that we make sure that they're able to run on IBM Cloud, they're able to interact with our technology. Um, and then if you add that extra layer on top of it, I need to be able to enable these developers to build things in AI, um, which is also challenging. So I'm ramping them in AI, I'm ramping them in IBM Cloud, and I'm trying to mesh the two together. So I just want to plant this seed in the back of your mind for later. I said I wasn't going to make you do anything else, but put it, put it in the back of your mind for later slides. So here's some of the considerations that I came up with. And like I said, my brain works in lists, yours might not, so you don't really have to read through all of this. But I just started jotting things down of, in this space, what are the things that I'm going to have to consider to make sure that I'm setting up these developers for success? And some of these I need to get better about personally, and in some cases too, I have to inspire and influence other teams to also care about some of these things, which is also a challenge. So these are not the folks that are going to respond the same way to our traditional <coughs> enterprise development audience. Um, we can't just have them hack on our API with a brief introduction like we tend to do with some of our more corporate clients. We go in, we're like, hi developers, here's our API, here's our docs, we're in the back of the room, if you have any questions, bye. Um, you can't really do that with these folks. You really need to sit down, it really needs to be more of a handheld experience. Um, and you can see some of that in these bullet points here. But one of the really, really big things that I noticed was we needed to be really, really careful about attention span and quality of attention. And that goes back to that night and weekend developer. 
So a night and weekend developer is gonna be someone who maybe has a little bit of time here, a little bit of time there. They might be dealing with kids at home. They might be doing 10,000 other things to up their skills. And they may be coming home from a really long day of work to build their passion project. So how can I take that into consideration with some of the content that I'm building to make sure that these folks get what they need out of our stuff? So chunking up how to's, um, making sure that we have series with every article or every how-to that ends in a small chunk of work rather than here, sit down and take this six hour course and at the end of it, you'll have a something. You need to have a something like 10 minutes in because you don't know how long it's gonna take that individual. Maybe they're going off and Googling other things because they don't understand some of the jargon that's in place. All of these things you need to consider. Time estimates, level indicators, um, all of this is incredibly important when you're working with someone who maybe just doesn't have the quality of attention that an enterprise developer who is being paid to work on a project with a team to enable something would have. Um, and the last bullet point here, audit existing material. So when I first started this journey, I was like, great, I'm going to reuse existing content in some way, shape, or form. So if we think of this as kind of a chart of, of buckets, like how, how can I take our existing material and classify it against these personas? I don't really want to say the word persona because it's not. Um, but these buckets of individuals, do we have existing content that will help them? How would we help them? Do we have to change kind of the blurbs, the marketing lingo? Um, or do we have to do something more than that? Um, so again, this is how my brain thinks, lists and buckets. So enterprise developers, pretty much all of our existing content falls into this. Um, no surprise, that's our target audience. They should all, for the most part, get it. And again, I know that's a generalization. I know not all <coughs> enterprise developers are equal. Um, but for the most part, the folks that we're writing our content for, enterprise developers. So then I think of the next group of people. So the highly technical folks, the ones who truly call themselves developers. Um, what, what could they benefit from that we have that already exists? So if I walk up to a group of these highly technical developers and I shout things at them like Kubernetes, they probably get it. Um, so maybe scaling with Kubernetes is gonna make sense for them. Um, they probably have some amount of experience with an SDK, so showing them how to use that SDK, get up off and running, show them where the examples are, things like that. Um, using Core ML and Watson visual recognition if they're building things with a mobile app, um, or maybe just a general overview of AI services and machine learning and deep learning, the different things that you can use within IBM Cloud for those. Cool. Then we get to our artists and designer folks, the ones that tell me that they're not very technical, but they're building these like super awesome viral games and uh, building incredible experiences for me as a gamer. Uh, maybe they're gonna be a little bit more receptive to getting started with the Watson SDK for Unity and overview of our AI services. But then I really sat down and thought about it and I was like, well, what do I need to enable, or how do I need to enable our, our hobbyists? Looks very similar to our artists and designers. So I started thinking of these, these natural buckets for things, and I wanted to reuse or repurpose existing material. And I was like, oh, this, this isn't gonna be that hard. So let's go back to talking about our, our IBM developer site for a second. I'm trying to reuse content that was built for developers that I'm not targeting specifically. And unfortunately, you're gonna see some issues with this approach, just kind of repurposing existing content. And part of it is because the audience just is not right. Um, we're gonna start seeing that things that are from our assumptions. So we made some assumptions about, oh, here, prior knowledge. Hey, you know Kubernetes, you get it, so if you wanna scale your game, you wanna scale your microservices on the back end, you already understand what that means. Maybe that was not the best approach. So what we actually needed was all of this mess. Again, I don't expect you to read this, we'll talk through this. So our docs are really great, and I cannot say that enough. But you have to have an experience with SDKs. And this particular community may or may not have that. They really need a lot of hand-holding, as I mentioned before. 
and we needed to go back to the basics. So some of the things that you can see in these screenshots from code that I've written or content that I've put out recently, um, by the way, I'd love to shout out to Curl earlier um, in the previous talk because I think 70% of my emails by the end of January were, what is Curl? <laughs> is that why my API call doesn't work? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I kind of had this, this reality check of, I can't just say, oh, here, if you're having issues connecting to our services and our SDK, check out our docs because they were like, your docs show me curl. I don't know what that is. Do I have to do something in curl before I can get it running in Unity? And Unity is written in C Sharp. So they're like, I just, I don't know how to write code and I'm worried. And I'm like, oh, I've created a monster. I've lowered the confidence of these individuals, many of which were telling me they're not technical. And they're trying to figure out how curl fits in with their C-sharp game. And in some cases, I was like, oh, you don't have to do anything in curl. And they're like, well, why is it the first thing I see when I see your dog? <coughs> like, oh, OK. So our SDK is also not without fault. And when I say our SDK, I mean the, the Watson SDK for Unity specifically. Um, the examples, the example directory, are written more like unit tests probably because they are. Um, so they're really, really great if you're familiar with that. And you can kind of piece together certain calls based on what a unit test might look like. Not so great if you've never seen any of that before. So what I needed to do was create snippets with the absolute bare minimum amount of code as a confidence building exercise. And the, mm, yes, the large chunk of code there um, kind of cuts most of it off. But that's literally just what we needed as of late last year to connect to the Watson Assistant chatbot framework in C Sharp on Unity with either username and password combinations or API keys, which was like a whole nother issue. Um, because people were like, well, I have a username and password, but I don't have an API token. And I was like, just use one or the other. And they're like, but where do I use both? Like, you, you can't get both. All these things were happening. So I'm going through and making the absolute bare minimum just to say, here's how you connect to this service, and this is what you can get back, or this is what you should get back. If you can't do the absolute bare minimum, why would I send you through a Hello World tutorial so that you can add 17 other variables into connecting with our cloud, your computer, your game, all this other stuff? It's just not going to work. Um, we need to help them through our documentation and in some cases, that was starting with curl. What was it? Why would they use it? Could they skip over it entirely? And in some cases, I just told folks, don't use curl. Click on the other tabs that show you examples in Java or Node.js or something if curl is like incredibly frightening to you. And all of our Watson APIs have examples in curl. But for whatever reason, this particular community responded to that as being intimidated and super confused. We need to show them exactly how to authenticate to these services, which is most of what's in those screenshots. Just showing them exactly how to enter in API keys, which I have since deleted, um, deleted before publishing this content. But they were just confused and would run far away from not only our cloud services, but our competitors' cloud services as well, because no one in this space was really helping them. So I need to show them how to use these services together. So this is where I enter my shameless plug. Um, I mentioned that we have these code patterns. I built a code pattern that shows our Watson Assistant service working together with speech-to-text and text-to-speech. And that's three services, if you're counting. This really showed just a very, very simple AR, augmented reality experience running on an iPhone. It's a little character. You tell it to walk forward. It walks forward and says something to acknowledge that that's happening. You tell it to walk backward. It walks backward. And you tell it to stop. It'll stop. So very, very simple. Here's our chatbot framework working together with speech to text and text to speech in this environment, all written on Unity, so you can see all of these pieces working together. And suddenly, people were getting it. And they were like, thank you. I couldn't get one service running, and I needed all three of these running. 
I just wanted to see it work. And two, I don't remember who said it in the room, but someone mentioned that game developers are, are hacking. Um, game developers are an incredibly resilient group of developers who will do anything just to get things working. They don't care necessarily about big O notation. They don't care about something that's most efficient. They can come back and fix it later. They just need to see it working. So I'm seeing folks that are taking my code pattern now, absolutely butchering it, but they know it's going to work. And so they're going off and they're doing all these other experiences. And in some cases, they are high school students. They're high school students who have told me, I'm so excited to replace my teacher with this app. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how your teacher feels about that, but <laughs> cool. Let me know if you have any issues. So, that's my shameless plug. Uh, so some assumptions were made and we missed the basics. So we really had to go back to the very beginning. How do you authenticate to our services? When, how, and why would you use things like curl because it's showing up in our documentation? Um, do we really just need to show you an exact code snippet? This is exactly how you enter that API key. No additional characters, no funny placeholders, no curly brackets in places there shouldn't have been. This is what my API key is, since deleted. Here is how you would enter it in your service. They were getting it. but we had to apologize a little bit. And we can fix this. We can help them grow based on changing some of the things that we had done, some of the delivery, supplementing some of that content that I talked about for our docs. And now you're probably like, Amara, your talk was like one size still doesn't fit all. And that's a plan. Here's where the t-shirts come in. I was going to do like a dramatic like think piece and wear some like oversized shirt, but then I just was like, no, I don't want to do that. So instead of a Venn diagram, I want to think of this more like t-shirts. I don't wear a double XL. I'm kind of a small person, but I could wear a double XL, but I'd be drowning in it. A game developer can wear a shirt designed for an enterprise dev, but it just doesn't fit quite right. So if we go back to the slide that we had with the different buckets, our content as it exists, actually for the most part today on iGame Developer, is really kind of that double XL. Everyone could wear it, they're probably just not comfortable in it. Could we do things to change our existing content so that even the developers that need the finest granularity get it? and they feel comfortable, they feel confident, they want to continue using our products, they want to continue to be in this space. So again, outside being our enterprise developer folks, inside being the game developers that we're hoping to kind of grow over time, not by feeding the cars. So some things to think about. Who's using your docs today? Are they getting what they need? And in some cases, you may not know who's using your docs today. So do kind of what I did and pick a different community to go out and explore. Um, when I first went to a game dev conference, it was really kind of a thing of me challenging myself and saying, I think we could do something in this space with AI. Could I get accepted to a conference and talk to game developers about what we're doing in AI? And I did. Very interesting. Um, are you agile or wagile? Uh, consider adjusting your personas. So your community is not going to be static over time. Even if you're targeting one group of developers today, it does not mean that it's going to always be that group of developers. And I think this is something where we kind of lose in the agile process because we're like, okay, we made these personas and now we've got to go through the other stuff and we're too busy iterating on our code base and doing all these other things that we stop thinking about the folks that are writing some of this stuff for. Did you cover the basics? Because I would argue that at least for the game dev community, we did not. Um, and then, because I'm coming off of the Society of Women Engineers conference the past couple of days um, and I'm really hyped about inclusion, did you make assumptions that could alienate groups? Um, did you make assumptions that could cause isolation, confusion, lower the confidence of the individuals in your community? Um, you could be unknowingly sabotaging these folks. Um, but for us, if they can't even authenticate to our services, 
they're probably not going to make it through the content that we've said is like the 101 or beginner level content. So I hope this gives you some things to think about. Thank you so much for your time.